I'm uh, Will Sexton. He's Sean Airy from Duke University Libraries. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, digital collections at Duke a lot this afternoon. Digital collections is a program that produces content and maintains content for a couple of different places on the library's website. The main one is at the top there. That's library.duke.edu slash digital collections. I'm also going to mention the archival finding aids to some degree. They are the finding aids for the Rubenstein Library, which is our special collections library at Duke, and they're at the URL that you see below. I'm going to sort of try to give some context and uh, give kind of an overview of digital collections at Duke, uh, leading up to framing the main problem that we're here to discuss today. If I linger too long in providing context and get sidetracked, Sean, please just give me a kick and I'll try to keep it going. Um, Digital collections at Duke is mentioned obliquely in the library's uh, strategic plan. There it is down at the bottom, highlighted in blue, and I'll bring it out. And, and under goal two, providing digital content, tools, and services, we're kind of mentioned as accelerating the digitization of unique libraries' materials and increase access to digital scholarly content in all forms. Uh, the um, me. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna keep going and maybe I can get it kind of back up at some point. But, um, so this is the, um, this is a digital a collections grid that comes from a blog post by Lorcan Dempsey in which he talks about the, um, uh, the, the resources in the library. He organizes them into four uh, uh, categories according to the level of stewardship that the library provides and then also the level of uniqueness of the materials. And working with digital collections, we tend to work in that lower left-hand grid there with materials that are uh, of high uniqueness and uh, require high stewardship from uh, library staff. They uh, tend to be special collections but are not limited to special collections. Okay. I'm gonna sort of talk about uh, how we approach this in terms of three challenges. Uh, the first is the organizational challenge um, and it kind of has to do with how we select materials for digitization, set objectives, support the processes. Very quickly I'll talk about that one and then content, how do we sort of deal with all the variety, the very heterogeneous collections that we are tasked with handling and then finally discovery, how do we help researchers to find and use our collections. So Sean and I are members of a team called the Digital Collections Implementation Team. This is it here. Uh, the membership of this team has kind of expanded and contracted over the years. We've done some reorganization lately that has led to it kind of being stripped down. So it has four members now, but I kind of expect it to grow in the near future. We draw a metadata librarian from the Rubenstein Library of Technical Services, a lead production developer from the Digital Production Center, which is where the, most of the digitization actually takes place. And then this is uh, Sean and me, the uh, lead designer, lead programmer for the implementations team. And we uh, work in the digital projects department at Duke. We also, we have a number of other uh, uh, parts of the library that are in our orbit that we work with very closely. Uh, over here on the uh, far right, the Rubenstein Library Digital Collections Collection Development Group, which is a newly formed group as a result of the reorganization and they are tasked with assessing proposals for digitized materials from their library. Uh, we also work of course very closely with conservation, a very important partnership. The conservation department actually adjoins the digital production center at Duke and they always work very closely together. We work with cataloging and metadata services to provide description of materials and then over here the uh, digital projects and production department head is our boss, Deborah Kurtz, who's here. Hi, Deborah. And uh, her boss is the IT director at the Duke University Libraries. And uh, I kind of put them there because if we receive uh, proposals for uh, collections that are not from the Rubenstein Library, we'll go through uh, them as kind of an ad hoc collection development committee. Uh, I'm going to give a real brief overview, and the animations were awesome on this. Let's see if I can actually, <laughs> maybe I can get it to work, and if not, I'll just kind of muddle through. But um, I'm just going to give a, a real brief 
a real quick overview of the kinds of content nope okay that we work with um, in the uh, in digital collections and kind of a quick like a quick historical tour of digital collections at Duke so uh, one of the first projects that we worked on was a papyrus collection um, they're all scanned at 150 DPI criminally um, and, but uh, we just got uh, we just got the news last week that uh, the, one of the professors who was involved in this project at the beginning and the library have received a grant to place him in the library as a member of library staff together with two developers with whom he's uh, collaborated on a number of projects over the years to sort of take up the mantle of working with the papyrus and other early manuscripts that we have in the library. Uh, and that project was completed all the way back in 1995. Um, this is behind here is the animation it was awesome and now I'm just really it's kind of as much grace under pressure as I can actually muster right now um, so this is actually behind here is a piece of sheet music it's a very attractive cover um, and I was going to show you that we did a sheet music project and uh, this is a point we did this, uh, this is actually preceded the Dublin Core metadata initiative in, his, in terms of history, the, li the librarian, the cataloger who worked on this project devised this very elaborate and detailed metadata scheme for the sheet music. It goes on, there are this is like 30 metadata properties in this collection. And uh, when I took over uh, the position of metadata architect in 2002 at Duke, I started organizing these properties into the fields that look like Dublin Core and the ones that uh, were refinements of Dublin Core. And so that's basically how we do all of the metadata for digital collections at Duke now. This one is a great ad. It's, a, um, it's an ad for a tape recorder, 1950, and it's inviting people to use a tape recorder to record their Thanksgiving dinner so that they can preserve it and they can listen to it in the future. Uh, and when I saw that, I thought, so, when, when Duke Digital Collections wants to digitize that, you, you probably don't need to get the release forms from Grandma and Grandpa, but make sure that little Timmy and Susie sign theirs for us. Um, this was the first of many advertising collections that we've done. We have very strong holdings and advertisements, and it kind of introduced the product and company um, metadata fields, which are common across all of these advertising collections. You'll see a couple more examples as I go through. Um, 1999, we did a photographs, the William Gedney Photographs Collection, which uh, William Gedney was the first of a number of very important, uh, interesting photographers that, whose collections we've digitized over the years. Um, and then, right about then, 1999, all these projects were kind of grant funded. They're uh, kind of the, the uh, program coordinators brought in um, outside monies to fund these programs or these projects and then that all kind of stopped and for a number of years it was kind of a fallow period for digital collections starting in 2005 excuse me that's okay thanks um, that's fine. Uh, so it, around 2005 we created a digital production center that that unit started doing some uh, digitization again and uh, I was involved in, in those efforts to get that program started. Sean kind of joined up about a year later. And um, uh, we started doing some manuscripts. This is a, a draft from uh, Leaves of Grass. Um, and it was kind of interesting that we'd never, aside from the papyrus, never really done any kind of manuscripts before. And uh, bought, you know, sort of filled the room up with nice equipment and hired some staff and um, started doing digitization in earnest. You can see what was going to happen with the animations. It's going to fill out as a timeline. I spent like hours doing that. <laughs> uh, so we did also at the same time we did the World War II ration coupons. They're interesting because they're interesting dimensions, right? Long, and narrow. But also um, when you try to model something like this, we, we take the full sheet. And this is kind of meant to fold up and tear away. And then we do the individual coupons and then so how do you model that what's page one you know something like that and uh, so that was kind of an interesting project um, we did so we did a project of uh, dry collodion negatives uh, which if you're familiar with the material it's basically negatives that are made out of dynamite 
and you can't handle them in the library. They have to be stored in a freezer, and we couldn't digitize them ourselves. So this is a case where we had to send the materials to a vendor to digitize, and it kind of presented some interesting problems to us. So it's going to come back to this uh, later. But um, this is the Sidney Gamble collection. He was a, um, a an heir to the Procter and Gamble advertising fortune, and um, traveled in China in the 20s and 30s. Uh, took four trips to China in the 20s and 30s, took some astounding photographs, and these are very popular, and as you can imagine, uh, we get a lot of traffic from China for those. Um, next up, one of the big projects we did was television advertisements. We kind of worked with Apple on this one, and it's harder to see, but at this uh, pro projection, but right here you can see that we, uh, we, we uh, published this collection in iTunes, because we kind of did it as a partnership with Apple, and um, that was interesting. We had to uh, then model an album, you know, like this video album type, that we could then uh, serialize as RSS feeds. And then I think we had 140 of them. And each one of them had to be hand published by a staff member in iTunes. Um, and then later, the Internet Archive uh, uh, asked us if they could ingest the collection. And, and they didn't need anything. We just gave them the data, and they ingested it themselves. So. Um, so I've talked about advertisements, and I've talked about photographs, and now we have photographs of advertisements. Uh, this is um, a collection of uh, outdoor advertisements by the, it was made by the company that installed the advertisements. They would, they would take these photographs and use them as proof that they had completed the work they were contracted to do. And uh, this is the uh, Atlantic City Boardwalk. I believe this is in the 1930s. You can see there, there are two ads in here. And what happened with this one was the, uh, the archivist uh, created this m metadata for this collection before it was digitized. We had no intention to digitize it. Uh, and they just built this one table in an access database that had lines for every single ad that were in these photographs. And so when they'd come to a photograph like this, they, they kind of put the date and the place. And then they, they put in the information, the product and company information for one ad, and then they'd copy that row and paste it, and then they'd add the, the specific information for the next ad, which kind of created this modeling problem for us because up to then, we treated every single photograph, every single image as an item. And now suddenly, we had to treat an image as something that contains advertisements. And so we had to create a whole new kind of model for this one, and also, um, the table was never, that database table was never meant for a digitization project, and we had to do a lot of untangling. Next up, and I believe this was last in my review here, uh, oral histories, where we had to um, have a different album model. We published these in iTunes as well. We had to have a different album model because the, uh, the, the advertisements, we had just, uh, one file per advertisement, but the oral history interviews have multiple files, including PDF transcripts or Microsoft Word transcripts. And so this was a little more complicated, and uh, we're actually doing more of these now. So I mention all of this because um, this process of modeling things is really important to us in how we present these materials to the researchers and to users. And we consider this modeling process to be part of the chain of provenance for the materials. This is like the digital publishing part of the chain of provenance. And I'm pleased to cite a definition from our now retired former colleague, Steve Henson, who was one of the kind of uh, movers behind those early collections, those grant-driven collections that I talked about. And he talks about provenance. This is from the uh, SAA's Glossary of Archival Terms. And uh, he talks about provenance as uh, you know, the, the significance of archival materials is heavily dependent on the context of their creation and that the arrangement and description of these materials should be directly related to their original purpose and function. And we feel it's really important when we are uh, preparing these materials for digitization and publication on the web that we're able to reflect as much of the arrangement and description of the materials from the archives as we possibly can. And I think that when we start to talk about discovery of materials in just a few minutes, we want that work to be reflected in the discovery platforms that users use as much as we possibly can make it. So um, this was kind of an interesting example. 
It, if you can see this photograph, we saw this. We had no idea what was going on in this photograph. This is from the Gamble collection. So if you can see, there's this kind of guy lying on the ground. And there's another guy with the blindfold who seems to be hitting him with something. <laughs> and it had this uh, caption. And uh, so these uh, Gamble uh, photographs came with these labels. Every single one of them was in a sleeve with a label on it. And when we sent them to the vendor, we asked the vendor to digitize these labels because we had no idea. I mean, we couldn't look at these. You can't look at photographs of China in the 1920s. And unless it's the Forbidden Palace or some recognizable landmark, you have no idea how to describe the material. So this was all we had. And we decided when we were publishing this collection that we needed to publish these labels. And we put this kind of disclaimer label text derived from Gamble's handwritten notes because this is how we got it from the donor who gave it to us. And then uh, Sean and I gave a version of this presentation a couple weeks ago at the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina. And so we had no idea what's going on in this um, photograph. And uh, within five minutes of me showing this slide, one of the students had like found it and explained to us that there was a game called Are You There Moriarty, which involved lying on the ground blindfolded and you kind of call it's like it's like Marco Polo uh, but but with uh, with hitting uh, <laughs> and, um, and I thought that was great and I thought you know if the world were only fair we could hire her on, like right there we just offer her a job um, so so that was kind of a modeling challenge but now how do how do we model this this is a um, an anatomical flat book that was used in the late 19th, early 20th centuries to teach anatomy. It's kind of like a pop-up book, as you can see, and it's very elaborate, and this is a project that we're about to take on, and um, this may be the most challenging modeling exercise yet. And then just uh, real quickly, a couple of other things that we are working on, uh, some newspapers that we're gonna publish, and newspapers have their own kind of publication issues and concerns. We're publishing the Duke Chronicle and then uh, some early manuscripts, which are also, is also a very complex project. And so, I haven't done it again. So uh, this kind of brings me to uh, the main uh, issue of our presentation today, which is to talk about how to, how do we, um, help and able users to discover these materials. It's something that we've kind of wrestled with a lot over the years and as I said you know a couple slides ago we put a lot of work into the curation of these materials and we really want that work to be reflected and to assist uh, users in, in finding our materials as much as we possibly can. So I'm going to tell you about a project that we uh, work on at um, at, at Duke, uh, the Tripod 2 platform, it's a do-it-yourself digital collections platform. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about how, you know, what the architecture is in just a moment. Uh, Sean and I are the, essentially the lead designer and the lead programmer on this project, which as you're all aware from the academic library environment where resource on developers is great and numbers of developers are scarce, being the lead means that we're the only developers. <laughs> we get help from people, other contributions from folks now and then, but we've basically uh, been uh, kind of the caretakers of this platform for a while. And so it supports a number of different content types, digital collections, archival finding aids, and a couple of others which I won't uh, go into. Um, this is uh, kind of our, this is what our software stack looks like. and. Uh, this is it's kind of all of it. I'm not going to go into everything that's on this slide, but uh, we have XML as the data layer, Solar and Python. Solar is an indexing search engine platform, and Python kind of in the middleware. We use the Django web uh, development framework, and then we kind of have all of our different content models here that we kind of build out of Django, and then the uh, UI layer is um, HTML and JavaScript and CSS. Now, I'm going to just pull that red blocked out section out to highlight some things. And, um, and this is just bringing out that one section. And just show you that this section here is where so we've divided this into discovery and access. 
Access is really when you get an item on a page or a, or a collection portal page. And discovery is where you're doing, you're getting search results. You type in search terms and you get results. And um, uh, this, is, this block here is really kind of the most complex part of what we do. This, this part here is relatively easy for us. This is more complex. And um, Sean's going to talk a lot about usage data. But one of the things about it is that it's used in 12% of the visits to the digital collections website. So every time we want to do anything with this application, Tripod 2, we spend most of our time kind of working in this area, like rewriting the same like, uh, application piece uh, over and over again. And we just really kind of got tired of it. We want to get away from it. But it's also, it's just not, in the end, that important to our users. So um, we, we thought, so we thought about plan B. And uh, we, we sort of tried to use the system in DECA that we use for our catalog, for our library catalog. It's a commercial-based, faceted search engine. A lot of uh, e-commerce sites use in DECA. But the consortium of which we're a member in the Triangle area of North Carolina, the Triangle Research Library Network, has uh, an instance of Indeca that's supported by TRLN. And that, you know, that's uh, Duke, UNC, North Carolina State, and North Carolina Central Universities. And so we thought that we would, it's also the uh, platform for our library catalog. So maybe this is, seems kind of drastic, but that anima the animation that I was supposed to drop out but uh, so uh, we what we thought we'd do was just basically like a discovery transplant here right that was the, the idea we were going to take out that custom built piece that we did and replace it with Indeca and so we worked on it and it, it turned out it turned out pretty well it's this is kind of what it looks like now you, with a little bit of work with the TRLN uh, staff we were able to integrate our thumbnails in there. It's got facets over here. You can even see the collection context there for search results. But it's kind of limited, and it really didn't give us everything that we wanted. And in fact, um, the result, the end result of it was really, it kind of worked out more like this. It really just takes a little nibble out of that uh, functionality and uh, doesn't really um, uh, bring that much traffic to the website. So then we thought, well, we would kind of been experimenting a little bit with, uh, with using Google as a, you know, we've used it as a the website search for a while. And so we thought about experimenting with Google. And that's really kind of what we're here to talk about today. And so we had this idea, well, what if this will work? And it's really an experiment now. Um, the, um, the three kind of pieces of the experiment are schema.org, which is a technique for embedding, embedding structured data in HTML pages. It kind of gives you the, the use of things and not strings. It's really kind of a linked data platform. And enables, potentially, theoretically, enables the use of rich snippets, which Sean's going to show you uh, a little bit more about. But Rich snippets are when you kind of search for a Best Buy in your, in your neighborhood and you look at the Google results and you see the phone number and the address of the Best Buy. The, Google's using rich uh, structured data there from the Best Buy's web pages to display that information for you in the search results. Uh, Sitemaps is another framework that allows you to do targeted uh, uh, indexing. With Google, you're basically telling Google what you want it to index and when you want it to be indexed. And site search, which is a way to pull the Google tools into your own local environment. And so I'm just going to leave you with um, one last slide. Um, and it's really three numbers that we use to think about, that I use to think about this problem. Um, 80% of the time that Sean and I spend developing this platform involves working with the discovery functionality. This is es estimated. 12% uh, is the number of, is the is the uh, number of visits to the digital collection site that involve the use of this functionality. 
And 70,000 is the approximate number of items in digital collections. If we think back to that, uh, that collections grid, you know, 70,000, we put a high level of stewardship on those materials, but there are a lot of other resources in the library collections that are either unique to, the lot, to our library or over which we've kind of uh, provided this high level of stewardship. And can we pull those, um, those materials into an approach to discovery as well? So that in the end, the problem is how can we extend the impact of our work? And I kind of mean this in two ways. The first is how can we reach more people but spend less time working on the platform? And number two, how can we pull in more of the library's resources into a search framework or enable other content providers in the library besides digital collections to build to a particular framework that would allow their materials to be searched and discovered by users together with the digital collections. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean, who's going to uh, talk about the um, the, this solving this problem in more detail. I'm going to try one more time to get the the <laughs> slide uh, the slideshow to. Project. Maybe I should try. Maybe Google likes me better. It could be. You're a lot nicer to Google than I. <laughs> it's loading loading bar. Oh, maybe that's it. You should just wait awesome. until it loads. That was probably it. Yeah. <laughs> Patience. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about discovery, and I'm going to get to schema.org in a minute. But I want to sort of set the table first. Lorcan Dempsey from OCLC, uh, one of the great thinkers of library discovery, really helps us frame the problem that we're trying to solve and then gives us a call to action. Uh, the problem is, these materials are, are great. There's some great stuff in there. They don't really have their own gravitational pull that's so compelling for everyone to try to find them there. Uh, right? So it becomes important to actually care about SEO, to actually syndicate your metadata to these other hubs that are in, in users' more natural workflows. Uh, we can't just kind of go it alone and expect people to go find the library website and find our materials. Um, Dempsey says libraries have to take a more active approach here. So do something. We can't just put our, put our content up, expect that Google will have the correct representation of it, expect that uh, uh, any of these other sort of clients will then interpret it the way that we would want uh, the information to be interpreted. Um, uh, Sample, uh he uh, mentioned this at his presentation, the, the opening uh, plenary. This is another Dempsey concept of inside out and outside in collection. So outside in collections, uh, all library resources are not sort of created equal. They don't need the same strategy uh, behind discovery. So books and articles, the, the sort of bought and licensed materials are outside in resources. The things that are out in the world that the library is then trying to provide access to to its internal audience, right? Uh, but this, this corner that, that Will talked about that we're in, we're, we're working with inside-out resources. These are materials that are distinctive. They're, they're internal to, to us, to Duke. Only we have them. And the discovery is, we, we want to optimize discovery for everyone in the world outside of the walls of the library. So different strategies involve different approaches, different ways to think about discovery uh, in this particular domain that we're in. So in the past year, this is even with, even with a passive approach, um, only about a quarter of the visits to our digital collection site are coming via anything that we're doing on our sites, whether it's the, uh, the, the library catalog, which all of the digital objects are uh, accessible through and the collections, uh, the library website, librarians' research guides. Uh, no matter what we do, uh, it's, it's largely the traffic coming from other places. So uh, places like uh, referrals, so referrals from hubs like Wikipedia, Facebook, and then search traffic is is a very significant number. So over 30% more traffic is coming to this stuff through search engines than is coming through our own efforts on our own sites. And obviously, uh, you don't need three guesses to uh, figure out which search engine is dominating those, those uh, statistics. Um, Google matters the most. Um, so Google is important strategically. Google's important for us to think about to actively uh, create a strategy around. We have to optimize the representation of our materials in Google. Um, when we talk about that, it's uh, SEO. But SEO is different than it was five years ago, right? Some people hear SEO and they cringe and they say, well, that's all about nefarious schemes to you know, set up link farms and you know, keyword stuffing. And uh, SEO doesn't have to be a bad word. Uh, and particularly <coughs> now, within the last few years, SEO has really uh, evolved to the point where linked data and structured data within your pages is, is sort of the, the hot area in SEO. 
we're really interested in that. We're, we're, not, we're not interested in trying to game Google or trick Google into believing things about our collections that, that are not true. We are interested in most accurately representing semantically what objects we have in our collections in a way that Google understands. So the first, the first challenge is telling Google what pages of ours and which images to actually add to the index. We'll mention uh, sitemaps. Sitemaps.org uh, was an effort that Google collaborated with other, uh, with other search engines on. Uh, it's sort of an XML standard to uh, indicate exactly which pages you want indexed and when and what images are within those pages that you want indexed. And then Google has a really good webmaster tools that en enables you to, to sort of submit those sitemaps and see how much of your stuff is indexed. Uh, a whole suite of tools, also some structured data testing tools that are associated with that. Um, we're, we're getting a lot out of using webmaster tools. I can't believe we, we hadn't used it until just like this previous year. Um, highly recommend it. And then so if we've indicated which pages we want indexed, the next challenge is how does, how does Google know what's in, what's in those pages? What kinds of objects are represented? Um, so you know, a human being looking at this page can very easily uh, know that this is a photograph that has been digitized. It's a photograph that was, digitized, that was uh, taken by William Gedney in about 1955. It's a photograph that's from a collection called the William Gedney Photographs and Writings Collection. Um, all of those things, um, the way that this, this site looks, a human being can understand. Uh, a machine can't without a little bit of help. So this is the old school way of, mark, of markup, structured markup. Uh, there's some structure here, right? There's a heading, there's an image, there's an unordered list with a couple of list items. Yeah, there, there's, there's some structure, but there are no semantics, right? A, a machine isn't going to know that creator, Cole, and Gedney, William Gale is uh, actually, that's the guy who made this thing, right? So enter, so this is, this is not, not quite the approach that we're talking about. Enter structured data in HTML, right? This is a hot area, it's an area that, that the search engines are uh, all aboard with. Um, Berners-Lee's semantic web concept, obviously we're not 100% you know, there at the vision, but things are, I think, accelerating. Uh, things are getting a little easier. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing a lot of progress getting closer and closer to that vision. RDF, not a new concept, late 90s. Very good foundation for the semantic web idea. Um, uh, also, uh, kind of complicated if you're uh, coming at it like if you're a web designer like me, it's, a, a, it's verbose, it's complicated to pull off. Over time, things are getting, there's more convergence with RDF and, and the HTML representation, and there's also, uh, it's just gotten easier, the syntax has gotten easier, there are flavors of, of representing structured data that are just way easier to sort of wrap your head around. Uh, than full-blown RDF, um, especially RDFA Lite, which is a, a, a newer uh, flavor, but it's so, it's so, so simple um, to do that uh, I, I, can't, I, I can't imagine uh, not doing it anymore for any future projects. So, uh, so for any idea to take off, structured data really being hot, for any idea to take off, it has to be easy enough for people to actually um, be compelled to do, to, to um, be able to do. And then there also has to be some sort of killer app or some motivation for people to do it, right? So it's one thing to have structured data in your pages, but if you see no returns or no results from doing that, then why, why bother, right? So, so killer apps, um, here are two, uh, two companies who really care about linked data right now. And um, both are, are important and both provide some motivation, right? Google, about a year ago, created the knowledge graph. Um, and the slogan is, is awesome, things not strings. It's such a great way to sort of summarize in one small slogan what, the, what, the, what linked data uh, is and what it can, can do. Um, we have uh, a search for James B. Duke and instantly on the right hand side we're getting information about uh, his vitals, who he was, who's related to him. All of that uh, coming from linked data that Google ingested from somewhere in the web, whether it was DBpedia, Freebase. Uh, Google is, is caring about and using this linked data in a way that enhances their search results. It's in their best interest to do it, and it's in, it's in everyone else's best interest to, to provide information that they can then use. So not only the uh, knowledge graph presentation, but you'll see, we see this concept, rich snippets. And Rich Snippets is not just the name of the guy at Google who makes your results look pretty. It's, it's, it's a really compelling uh, presentation of, of results based on what's actually represented. So example is this vanilla French toast recipe. 
where right in, the, right in the snippet, we can see that this is a recipe that's going to take you 10 minutes to make, and it's got 332 calories. You can see every ingredient, right? So that's really helpful information to, be, um, to see right in the result if you're looking for recipes. And beyond the actual presentation, that same structured data, Google then provides uh, search tools to then filter your results. So in this case, if I am looking for a French toast recipe and I love cognac and I don't like bananas, I can check those yes and no boxes and I can filter and refine my results to just things that I would like. Um, so that's, that's really helpful. Facebook, uh, Facebook is, uh, created a vocabulary that uh, you can implement using RDFA that's the uh, open graph. So uh, it's a way to make your web pages play nicely in the social sphere, turn, turn web pages into social objects. Um, we've, we're using uh, open graph tags now in our, in our site and it makes it really easy when I want to link to uh, an object from digital collections. Facebook using, using the open graph tags knows exactly what the image is and what uh, description to use, um, and, and so both Facebook and Google uh, on the, the sort of the, the structured data train. Um, so, so we have mechanisms for putting structured data in our web pages, and the question becomes, well, what, what vocabulary do we actually use to describe the things that we're talking about on web pages? Schema.org is uh, still relatively new. A couple of years ago, the, the, the major search engines just got together and created a vocabulary, uh, a vocabulary to, that users, uh, people who have websites can use to describe the things that, that they are representing in their websites. The vocabulary is very search engine uh, centric, right? So there are things that are kind of universally appealing or universally applicable to a lot of, a lot of uh, various websites. Um, so things like uh, creative work is a type of object that you can describe using schema.org vocabulary and every and you sort of have these subclasses of things. So uh, every, everything is a thing, and everything can have uh, an image, a name, a description, and a URL. And then there are more specific kinds of things, like a creative work is a specific kind of thing. And there are more specific kinds of creative works that then have a couple other properties that you can, uh, you can use from the vocabulary to, to describe what they are. Um, it's, it's not a vast vocabulary that's going to cover all of people's needs for describing things on the web, right? It's, it's very limited, but um, there's, there's a lot there that, that we can already use um, to mark up the materials that we have, and uh, I'll, I'll show a little bit more of that. So we talked about rich snippets. Now, what kinds of things from the schema.org vocabulary actually give you rich snippets on the search, on the big Google search results screen? There's actually a lot, events, music, organizations, people, products, recipes, reviews, uh, software videos and breadcrumbs from sites. That sounds like an impressive list, and, it, and it, a lot of uh, people can have been, you know realize benefits from marking up these kinds of things. Um, with the kinds of digital objects that we're trying to represent, we, we don't have a, a lot of alignment here with things that we will instantly get rich snippets uh, by doing. Um, but as Will mentioned, uh, you know one of our our aims is improving our representation in Big Google, but we're also uh, working to uh, have this localized Google experience where we can build our own rich snippets uh, regardless of whether Google uh, turns them into rich snippets for everyone on Big Google. So uh, using schema.org vocabulary, the, the item page that I showed, we can at the, the very root level of this web, web page, item page is a type, of, uh, a type of web page which is a type of creative work. The, uh, the item page has a creative work represented in it, and that is the creative work is the photograph. Uh, the photograph has a media object, which is the, the JPEG that is here, the digitized version, and the creative work has uh, all this metadata at the bottom, which then uh, we, we can also use schema.org properties to describe, uh, to, to describe these, uh, these fields. Here's an interesting, uh, interesting concept or interesting use of schema.org, also to relate this particular page or this photograph to the collection that it's from. So uh, uh, what's highlighted here is some RDFA light where we can say property equals schema namespace is part of to make this sort of predicate that's saying this is a, a page that is part of this other collection page. And then down in the metadata where some of the, some of the magic happens, uh, more RDFA uh, property, for example, the uh, William Gedney's name in the metadata field, we can just have property equals schema creator 
and that instantly maps his name to the creator field for uh, the creative work in the schema.org vocabulary. We can mix things in here, so you can see uh, for the identifier, we've used DC identifier to be representing some of the metadata in Dublin Core, and you can even mix, uh, we haven't done this now, but we can very easily for uh, William Gedney's name, put schema colon creator space DC colon creator, so we can, so we're not just you know using schema.org as a as a replacement for the Dublin Core that we already have. Um, it's they can kind of work in tandem, and, and RDFA makes it really easy to sort of mix these vocabularies in that way. So if we've got things represented, we're using we're using the vocabulary we want to use. We've got the images and the index and the pages indexed that we need indexed. Then the challenge we turn to is. Uh, putting Google back in our site, right? putting Google in our stack. And if Google is part of our stack, it's, it's actually pretty good for us because it makes it really hard for us to neglect our presence on Google. And we, we really, really need to care and be aware of what our users are experiencing as they're using Google to find our materials, right? So this, uh, other people might call this dog fooding. We want to use the products that our, our, our users are expected to use and, and then we'll gain some empathy toward their experience. I think uh, before we started really seriously looking at this, there, there were times uh, for, for too long that, for example, we had been accidentally blocking Google's robot, uh, Google's uh, images crawler, and we, we had nothing indexed in Google Images. And you know, this is the kind of thing that you notice if you're actually relying on Google as part of your stack. So Google custom search to Google is not, you know, if, if, if there are concerns that Google is the anti-library or it's the enemy, uh, you know, it's, it's not a huge stretch that we'd be talking about adding Google to the stack. We, we use Google for the library website search, Google custom search, that's free. Uh, it powers it, it's, it's great, we get you know, nice relevance ranking. And digital collections are, are also indexed in the library website search, and they come back. Uh, you know, we're already sort of a little bit there, where we're taking it a little bit farther. Uh, so, so we could just you know, throw Google custom search free with no structured data and let that be the digital collections interface, right? Um, you, it, would, it would get us part of the way there. It's pretty good, uh, but what it, wouldn't, what it would take away is this ability to search on particular properties, right? Advanced searches, uh, facets, and, and refining by properties. Those are important uh, functions that we need to support. So that's you know, just a uh, out of the box Google custom search, not quite good enough. Google Site Search is highly customizable version of Google Custom Search. Google Site Search, highly customizable version of Google Custom Search. Um, it costs a little bit of money. It's not, you know, prohibitively expensive. Um, they they offer several APIs to be interacting with the data, which is cool and also frustrating at, at times uh, because we have so many choices. Here's an example of the work that we've just kind of been tinkering with. This is using a, one of the JavaScript APIs where we can do a search on Pepsi and then present make our own rich, rich snippets. You can see here we're pulling back particular properties that we expressed using RDFA schema.org properties and spit them back out into the, into the interface. Here's an example using the XML API, which is just an example to show that we can query Google and get XML representation of what they indexed from our site, from our structured data um, that we had embedded. And we can develop against this XML and we've experimented with this as well. And then there are other goodies too. So image, Google Image Search also, uh, they, they, you get they, the APIs to the image search tools. Uh, a lot of our materials are image heavy and have really compelling images. Google also gives you an API to use their filtering results for images. So they have things like search, uh, filter by faces. So this is just you know, faces of digital collections just based on what the Google Image Index has determined to have a face in it. Some of these, you know, no, no librarian is going through and saying, there's a face, so I got to add a face metadata field. It's all automatically determined by Google's algorithms. Same thing with color, search by blue. Um, so these are tools that we're, we're getting uh, by using the Google API that we don't have to develop ourselves and metadata we don't have to create. So, so far, um, I'll share some of the lessons uh, as we've been working with this data and, and, and working with this idea of adding Google to the stack and relying more on it as a more central part of what we're doing for discovery for the, these materials. It's a little bit harder than we thought. I think um, even two months ago, we would have thought that we would have this live on the site and you would all be able to be you know, clicking around on it as you're watching uh, this presentation. We're not quite there. Um, it's harder than we thought because I think of all the choices that we have to make. One of the choices is uh, how to express the structured data. So there's microdata, there's RDFA, and then the RDFA Lite. Uh, we, we've experimented with each of these approaches, and each one 
um, Google picks up in a different way and, 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 and presents back to us slightly different structured XML to work with. Um, so we're, we're still even not 100% sure which one of these three is, is the most optimal uh, for our needs. So there, there's the mappings, right? There's the vocabulary of schema.org and which of the fields actually make sense and are an accurate you know, kind of crosswalk to what we have and those are decisions that we, we need to work with. There's sort of the, the, the concept of how to mix the vocabularies um, uh, correctly and have all of that represented right in that presentation layer. Uh, as Will mentioned, uh, that METS is that at the data layer, everything's stored in METS and we use this qualified Dublin core. We can't spit it, all that right back out on the presentation layer and use that, but we want to mix, we want to use the vocabularies um, that we want to use schema.org in addition to those uh, library specific vocabularies. And then the, the different, the three API flavors has also been a challenge because uh, they all kind of give you different uh, capabilities for interacting with the data and for de developing against it. Um, so just a lot of choices to work with. Not really well documented, which is also challenge, uh, a challenge for us. Um, the indexing isn't on demand, so as we're sort of doing this trial and error, a lot of times it's like we'll build a test page and then like submit it and then we'll have to wait three days to see if it actually did what we wanted it to do. Um, and then the in images are getting indexed at a really slow rate. The, the pages get in indexed pretty quickly, but that, that's frustrating for our testing of the, the image search tools. And then big Google um, rich snippets are, maybe we kind of expected this, but they're, they're mostly elusive. We don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of examples of things that uh, look differently in big Google searches now that we have schema.org markup on our pages. I will share one success story. This is uh, that AdViews collection that, that, that Will talked about where we have these albums of videos that, uh, of commercials, right? This was pre-schema.org. We had really the standard snippet where you have the, just, you know, the title and uh, a little snippet of text. And then after we had schema.org tags, um, I think we marked them up as video gallery objects. Um, then when Google uh, presents this, it says how many items, 20 plus, and then it actually starts listing the commercials that are uh, included. So this is you know, just kind of an encouraging example that some of the work will, uh, will lead to better snippets on big Google experience. Um, and you know, the, the, the Google promises to uh, do this for more kinds of, of, of objects that are marked up using the schema.org vocabulary in the future. Um, so you know, we'll see if we can get more than this. So what's next? We gotta put in, uh, somewhere we've gotta build it uh, so users can actually start using it in the, in the live site. That'll hopefully be within the next couple of months. Um, we'll feel like it's cooked enough to share it and, and hopefully you all might take a look at that point and give us some feedback. We have some partners who uh, we work with on other projects who are also looking at this area. NC State Libraries, um, as usual, is, is on, the, on the cutting edge here too. Um, Jason Ronallo, who's the uh, uh, leader of the Digital Libraries Initiative there, is uh, one, of the, one of the big leaders in this field right now, looking at schema.org and digital collections. And uh, we uh, think we're, we're, we're uh, meeting with him soon to sort of compare notes and see where, where, where there are collaboration opportunities. You know, everything from establishing some best practices uh, to uh, there, are, there are other collaboration opportunities to actually try to um, add new kinds of properties and new kinds of objects to the, uh, the schema.org vocabulary. For example, uh, when schema.org just, was just released, the newspaper industry was actually working on uh, a standard called R News that was uh, 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 vocabulary for marking up uh, newspaper, online newspaper articles. Uh, right after schema.org was released, they ended up, the, the newspaper industry got all of their uh, vocabulary added to the schema.org official vocabulary. Uh, you know, you, you, you have any, how many standards do you want? Like, it was nice that they could just use what their work and develop, uh, add to uh, a standard that others could use. So we need to measure, is there any impact? Like, uh, we know that, uh, you know, rich snippets is a possible outcome. Uh, are, are, is structured data actually used as signifiers of relevance? Does it help um, with click-through when people get rich snippets? We're starting to measure these things. We have baselines established and we're measuring every quarter and taking screenshots of, of, of the search results for key kind of uh, landing pages. And then locally we assess, does this actually give our users a better discovery experience? And we have a lot of ways of, that we do that at Duke. And then do, do, do we as developers, end up spending less time maintaining this part of the stack if it's Google and not solar. Um, and so here's where we are uh, right now. We've kind of done the first 
three things. We've got the baseline metrics. We've got schema.org markup. We've got Google indexing the, the materials and we're working with the results. Um, and there's a lot of kind of back and forth between steps two, three, and four where it's trial and error and we try something and we adjust. Um, hopefully we'll get to deploy on the site within a month or two and we will be working with engaging other partners on best practices and talking about the vocabularies. Um, and then we obviously just assess what we're doing and, and continue to enhance and refine it. Uh, so that's where we are. Hopefully within, yeah, within, by the summer we'll be able to share a lot more with you all about what we've found and we'll share some links so you can try it out and, and let us know uh, what you think. So I think that's all that we've got and we've got about 10 minutes. Okay, well, thank you all for coming and thank you for those who stood in the back the whole time. So.